This panel is all about role models. And we are privileged to really have three amazing role models on this panel. Uh, Carolino Barco, and I'm not going to read their bios except to say that right now she's at the IDB. She's been, as I said earlier, a minister, an ambassador, a mother, um, everything. Um, next to her is Patty Menendez Cambo, another amazing role model. She runs uh, the international practice of Greenberg Turig and is a mother of four boys, uh, which is really interesting. Um, and she can tell you about that. And at the end is Karolina Etrovic, Etrovic, Etrovic um, who has traveled from Chile. And she is the executive director since 2005 of Mujeres Empresarios. And that's just, I know less about you, but we're going to hear all about you. Because I'm going to turn these questions upside down. And I want each of our panelists, if I can, to ask you for two to three minutes, just speak about yourself. And tell us a little bit of you know, who you are and what's, what drives you. Okay. Carolina. Thank you, Susan. I'm, first of all, I want to say I'm so happy to be here. So what's driving me is being here. And I grew up in a family of a lot of strong women. I don't know, it's, is it sounded? Is this better? Yeah. OK. Well, first of all, what drives me is to be here and to be among you. No, they still can't hear. They can't hear. Well, maybe I'll just, I'll just hold it. OK. The first thing that drives me is to be here. I am so happy to have been invited by Susan. I believe very strongly in women. And I think in Latin America, we have very strong women. And that's why, as Margarita was saying, if we can empower them, they're already taking care of their families. They're always, they are the basis of our society at every single level. And I am part of a group, as I think most of you, we are very privileged in our countries because we have education and we have the possibility to make a difference. So I think from a very early age, I felt this incredible responsibility because I come from a family where my father was in public service all his life. He went from being councilman to being uh, minister of public works, minister of agriculture, ambassador, congressman, and then president. But when I was growing up and I was in my teens, he was the mayor of Bogota. And every Sunday, we would go visit the different towns. This was a time when Bogota was growing at 6% a year. In other words, it was doubling its population every 12 years. And we had huge areas where there was no water, there was no sewage, there were no schools. We were getting there after 10 or 12 years of a population being there. And yet, they were so grateful. They were so happy. It made such a difference. And I just, this really changed my uh, life. And, let, and that's why I studied urban planning, etc. Then I was thinking, what else had great influence on me? I think I was lucky I'm part of a generation that came after some of our role models had already opened the doors for us. So all of my generation in Colombia went to college. We weren't fighting for that, but we didn't have mentors. And I always learned to ask and to depend on the people around me about how they were approaching things and how they were doing it. So I would say that one thing that for me has always been important is this network of friends and of being able to sort of help each other as we make difficult decisions and we move to ahead, and believing in teams. I don't think you're ever any better than your team, and I always find that if you ask the questions, there's usually somebody who will help you, and if you want a good team, you always get a really good team. And maybe I'll finish just then with one of my difficult uh, decisions, which just uh, I feel so privileged that I was asked to do this, President Uribe, who was president of Colombia from 2002 to 2010, um, reached, came to Colombia at a moment where it was very difficult. We were really at a moment of incredible violence. Uh, the drug trafficking had gotten completely out of control. Our guerrilla groups had become very strong. Zero investment in Colombia, not by foreign investment, but not national investment either. And the situation, we were really sequestered in our cities. And I was the head of urban planning in Bogota. 
And I got this call. I had gone to city council, spent a very, very difficult day listening to all these debates, not getting anything done. I wasn't in a very good spirit. I come out to the, to the parking lot and I get this call from a friend of mine who was an advisor to President Uribe. And he said, President Uribe would like you to be his foreign minister. And I thought, my goodness. Uh, this is, you know, this is a bad day. Don't make a joke tomorrow. <laughs> so my friend said, no, this is really that way. And I said, but why? Why not maybe then housing or urban planning? He said, no. He has two reasons. One, you have been looking at Bogota in a very different way and looking at it in, in an international way, how to change it. And he wants Colombia to be presented in that way and to think about it, and he believes that at the foreign ministry you will find the technical support you need, but they need the drive and the leadership you have. And secondly, he said, he wants to have a cabinet which will be 50% women and 50% men because Colombia is facing a very difficult moment of conflict. And he thinks that having 50% of women will help to make this a more balanced cabinet where we can have different kinds of discussions. So I had f half an hour to make up my mind, he said, because he wants to make this uh, announcement. So I went back to my office, and I had three very good friends, two men and a woman. One of the men said to me, why would you do this? You don't know about this. He's a very good friend, and I have always appreciated his very clear way of answering. And he continues to be a very good friend. Then my other, the other male friend said, I really wouldn't know what to say. And my girlfriend said, why not? Why not assume this challenge? You come from a father who taught you, gave you the education and the example that you need to assume challenges. Try it out. You can do it. Believe in yourself. And we, these three friends says, we will go with you to the foreign ministry, although we don't know very much except planning. So here you have an example of, so I called up my children. Uh, we were going through a difficult personal moment because my, my, um, my marriage was breaking up. So my children were very important at that moment. I said to the three of them, each one independently, you are the most important person for me right now because we need to pull through. And every single one of them said, no, mommy, go ahead. We're behind you, and this is going to help us. So I wanted to share this with you because I think a long life, and this was just uh, 14 years ago, we're always being asked to assume incredible challenges. So I would say believe in yourself, get, you know, believe in your friends, build these uh, groups, and I think this is what allows you to accept a challenge that for me was an incredible privilege. I was foreign minister for four years, then I came and I was the ambassador from Colombia to the United States, so I represented my country for eight years, and I must say that that has been an incredible highlight of my life, and I am very, very grateful for that opportunity and for all the support that I, I got. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Carolyn. <laughs> Patty. Tell us a little bit about, about you and... Um, you know, I, I think from a role model perspective, I grew up in a family where there was a lot of focus on education and women. And it, a lot of it was being educated, going to finishing school, studying. What was interesting was that there was no expectation that you would work. And I remember when I came back from um, UPenn Law, you know, I had graduated really early. I was 22 years old. And, you know, I was getting married and, you know, my family looked at me like, why are you working? And I thought to myself, well, why would I have done all of this and not worked? At what point did you think I, I wasn't going to work? And they were just like shocked, you know. And so to me, I think that the fact that they focused so much on education was great. But at the same time, I think there really was no expectation that, that I would find passion in what I do and that I would work from from that perspective. I, I had four kids before um, I turned 30, which to me has been an amazing, um, I always say I had four because I was young and I didn't know what I was doing at the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I used to say before. Today, I say it has been the most 
important thing in my life. No matter what transaction I'm working on, no matter what I'm doing, I, at the end of the day, they are my automatic balance. It is not a life balance program at work. It's not even some, my own husband. It's really just, they are the ones that remind me every day that I have two roles in this world, and they're both equally important to me from, from that perspective. I, I think that, you know, I, I'm a lawyer, I, I'm, a New, I'm a New York lawyer, I work in a, a particular field of law that is very scarce um, for women. Um, I started chairing our international practice um, about 10 years ago, and I was the only woman in the department. The, in, everybody else was men. I, I think they almost thought that it was, you know, interesting that I was the chair at times because I would say, we need to do this. And then they would say, you know, why? Why this? And we always did it this way. And so I think from a role model perspective, if you lack a role model, which I did in, in my profession, my mentors were men. There just weren't women in the process. Um, and I, I think it gives you a lot, at the end of the day, you have to find a lot of courage and, and you know, obviously overcome the many fears that you have along the way to say, well, what's the worst that can happen? Nobody else done it. You know, if, if you fail, that's okay. You know, they'll try again um, tomorrow. And as I went developing the practice group, oh, sorry, just developing the practice group there and growing and focusing, you know, I do um, cross-border m and so I basically represent foreign entities investing in other countries. And when I first started practicing in that area, you know, we, as a U.S. lawyer, you put together your documents, you send it, your, the foreign counterparty looks at it, and there was always like a big disconnect because, you know, our legal systems are different from jurisdictions and things. And one of the things that I found, and I have found this to be true today within the female members of, of my practice group, which we have now plenty of uh, female um, partners and women, was that the men would send the document and then they would just, they, they would say, oh, there's a problem, we can't do this here, we can't do this there, never thinking that there might be, you know, a, their equivalent of under local law. And I found that the women would be asking more questions, would do more things, and they weren't so concerned about being right rather than just being, getting it done. And so I do think that it's that combination and the different things that, that's important. Um, I, I think in, you'll find that as you find, there's many professions where there is no actual role model, and I think that's where the networking, that's where the support comes from your female and male counterparts, but, but certainly um, supporting each other is what makes that crossroads um, a little bit um, easier. Thank you. Carolina, tell us a little bit about yeah. yourself. Uh, thank you. Uh, I prefer to speak, uh, speak in Spanish. Okay. Ya, eh, primero, agradecer, eh, Susan, el, esta invitación. Eh, me parece fantástico y una excelente oportunidad el poder estar con ustedes acá. Eh, yo vengo de, de Chile y la verdad que, que uno ve eh, que el interés que hay en, 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 en esta organización y en Estados Unidos por este tema es el mismo que nosotros tenemos en nuestro país. Entonces, es bien impresionante ver que finalmente los problemas o eh, los desafíos son los mismos. Eh, en la parte personal, contarles que, bueno, yo soy, eh, una, eh, estudié, eh, soy agrónoma, soy ingeniera agrónoma, y la verdad que, que mi vida siempre eh, escolar, después de universitaria, siempre fue rodeada de hombres. Estuve en un colegio mixto, eh, estuve en un colegio mixto y por lo tanto, la verdad que eh, éramos siete mujeres y treinta hombres, entonces el estar eh, en contacto permanente con ellos, la verdad que desde chica ayuda mucho y eso en el tema de los, de los roles y, y de los modelos es muy, muy relevante. Luego en mi carrera universitaria principalmente también era nombre y, y hasta todo iba bien hasta ahí hasta que eh, traté de trabajar y ahí viene la primera parte como discriminatoria que he sentido en mi vida, que, que fue la verdad bien puntual en ese minuto, que era trabajar de agrónoma. En Chile en particular es un país eh, bastante machista, ha ido disminuyendo, pero obviamente hay... Eh, creencias arraigadas muy difíciles de cambiar de un día para otro y en el caso particular del campo todavía más. Yo me especialicé en enología, soy enóloga también 
Y la verdad que ahí eh, finalmente lo que logré como primer trabajo fue trabajar en la Viña Conchitor, que es una de las viñas más grandes del mundo actualmente, es la cuarta viña del mundo, pero en la parte comercial. No pude optar a la parte del campo, que en ese minuto a mí me gustaba, yo tenía 23 años y era lo que yo quería hacer. Más adelante en mi vida ha tenido un montón de, de, de caminos diferentes y, y yo creo que la palabra clave, lo que me ha pasado a mí en particular, es la palabra oportunidad. Yo tengo un, un, un a ver si se puede decir, un, eh, una gran admiración por mi papá, eh, aquí también Carolina, tú nombras a tu papá como un modelo importante para mí también, eh, es una persona que siempre me ha inculcado, eh, con mi mamá también, pero él en particular, el emprendimiento, las ganas de hacer cosas nuevas, de atreverse, de crear, de que da lo mismo que uno se equivoque, porque, digamos, todo tiene solución. Eh, y yo creo que eso ha sido como parte importante en, en mi formación. Eso hizo que, al, al estar yo en un trabajo que era con una oficina, me empecé a dar cuenta eh, lo que pasaba en el, en, con mis compañeras de trabajo, que en ese, en ese entonces eran obviamente mayores que yo, yo era, tenía, era, era bien joven en ese minuto, y tenían este problema de, de la duplicidad, del trabajo, la, la familia, y, y bueno, las típicas problemáticas que uno ve eh, que, que suceden. Y muchas les pasaba que querían independizarse, decían yo lo que quiero es tener una empresa, porque si tengo una empresa voy a poder manejar mi tiempo, y de esa manera voy a poder estar más con mis niños, voy a trabajar más quizás, pero de otra manera. Y esto me empezó a dar un poco vuelta y en el camino me cambié de trabajo, me fui a trabajar con mi papá en un asunto que era de formación, en una, como un instituto de formación empresarial que era muy orientado a los hombres, pero que empezaron a entrar mujeres. Y, y mi papá es muy visionario, entonces dijo, yo, yo veo que el tema de la mujer viene muy fuerte y me gustaría eh, que hiciéramos algo específicamente de mujeres. El año 98, o sea, realmente en Chile no era tema, nadie, no, era súper raro, en verdad. Y lo hicimos pusimos aviso en el diario, partimos, el primer curso lleno, el segundo curso lleno, el tercer curso lleno. Obviamente yo a cargo porque era la única mujer que trabaja ahí. Y dije, qué raro este fenómeno. Y cuando terminaba este curso me decían, yo quiero hacer mi propia empresa. Eso es lo que yo quiero hacer. Entraban muchas mujeres que eran, trabajaban como eh, asalariadas, o sea, eh, eh, contratadas. Y querían salirse de eso y manejar sus empresas, sus tiempos. Y ahí empezó a formarse este pequeño grupo que a medida que fueron pasando los cursos, llegaron a formar 400 mujeres en un tiempo determinado. Y esas mujeres fueron que a la larga dieron impulso a lo que en ese minuto yo le, yo le dije a mi papá y a sus socios, bueno, ¿qué hago con estas mujeres que me preguntan cómo sé? Yo no tengo idea. Bueno, nosotros damos toda la apoyo, pero hazlo tú. Y ahí un poco en base a lo que ellas necesitaban, a lo que ellas querían, fuimos menos inventando, porque ahí como les digo, no había nada, una organización que se llamó Mujeres Empresarias y que finalmente lo que hace, hasta el día de hoy ya llevamos 11 años, es... Eh, ayudar a todas aquellas mujeres que quieren formar sus empresas, partimos, esa fue la orientación original, y luego a todas aquellas mujeres que quieren mejorar o mejor, mejorar posiciones en, su, en sus empresas, por lo tanto le llamamos emprendimiento corporativo. Y ha sido, la verdad que, por eso digo, una oportunidad que se me pasó por el camino, la, creo que la, la supe tomar, y, y tremendamente buena, eh, me siento una persona tremendamente privilegiada, como decía Carolina también, por el hecho de haber tenido un acceso a una educación de calidad y haber estado preparada, tal vez yo estudié agronomía, pero tuve un poquito la visión también de estudiar eh, ingeniería civil, mucho, muchos ramos de ahí y, y, y economía, por lo tanto sentía que tenía algo las herramientas para eso y fue un éxito hasta el día de hoy, eh, yo cuando formé esto, hice el lanzamiento y estaba a punto de tener mi tercer hijo, yo tengo cuatro hijos, desde nueve hasta 16 años, y la verdad que dije, bueno, voy a hacer este lanzamiento y voy a ir a hacer el postnatal o lo que sea, que sea un, un mes y medio. Y, y resulta que al día siguiente de esto apareció en el diario como la gran noticia en la parte de economía, sobre todo que fue lo que más me llamó la atención, este lanzamiento de Mujeres Empresarias. Y la verdad que desde ese día nunca más para sonar el teléfono, cero postnatal, nunca más me fui a la casa, tuve la guagua al día siguiente en la oficina. Y así o así hasta el día de hoy estoy tremendamente agradecida, el día tenemos... Eh, 3.500 socias eh, activas, más una oficina que abrimos en el sur de Chile gracias al, al Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo del FOMIN que nos apoyó en eso, que se llama Mujeres Empresarias Patagonia y que atendemos también un sector enorme de mujeres con emprendimientos tremendamente diferentes, muy entretenidos. Ha sido todo un éxito y además estamos ahora con el emprendimiento corporativo muy fuerte fomentando a mujeres en cargos altos y como alguien decía, creo que usted también lo dijo, eh, Margarita, eh, 
hay que buscarlo. Las personas están, cuando eh, uno dice necesito una gerente, claro, a primera quizás no está, hay que buscar, está. Y también nos hemos eh, 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 trabajado fuerte últimamente en el tema de las directoras de empresa, que también nos decían no hay. Hoy día tenemos un directorio literal de, de mujeres que, son, que están capacitadas y las hemos capacitado para eso. Y finalmente en el tema de inversionista, que también acabamos de formar un fondo de inversiones, que es algo inédito yo diría en el mundo. De hecho nos dijeron eso, que era el segundo caso en el mundo en que las inversionistas son solo mujeres. Y la verdad que eso nunca había pasado en Chile ni cerca. Eh, mujeres de alto patrimonio que nunca tampoco les habían dado la oportunidad en fondos tradicionales de ser inversionistas. Y bueno, todo esto han sido, como les digo, tremendas oportunidades y, y la oportunidad también de ayudar a muchas y muchas mujeres. I want to do something a little bit different. They think I'm going to ask them another question, but I'd like to open it up and see, does anybody in the audience have a question um, for any one or all three of them? If you do, just raise your hand or just stand up and ask the question. Somebody must have a question. No? Yes, Renati. I'm Johnny Manning. I'm the president. Oh. I'm the president and chairman of the Tinker Foundation, which is a philanthropy here in New York City. And we work in Latin America almost exclusively. I was quite struck by all your stories, because I'm a, I'm a child of the 60s. And when I started working, uh, there was almost a choice that had to be made. If you wanted to be a, a high-level, powerful executive, that you couldn't have both children, family, or I should say three, and a career. But all of you have very successfully integrated uh, motherhood, uh, family, and careers. And uh, I wonder if you ever had to make the decision whether you would have children or whether you would be a high-powered career person or whether you put one first and then were able to then uh, segue into the next part of your life. I, Everybody has a comment here. I'll tell you there was one crossroad in my life. Um, I, I, I love very much what I do and I, I, I study, but when um, my second son was three years old and I was pregnant with my fourth, he was diagnosed with autism. This is pre any of the research that exists with autism today. Um, you know, and I really had to sit down and think about whether I wanted to continue working or I wanted to stay home. You know, I'm pregnant, I'm going with my fourth, and it was the most difficult thing, I think, that I went through. And I remember, you know, going through all these specialists and flying to New York and Boston. I mean, there just wasn't the information. My son will be 20 um, this year in December. There just wasn't the access to information that there, that there is today. And I remember one of the therapists that was working with me, and she said, do you know anything about speech therapy? And I said, no, but I'm sure I could learn. You know, I'm relatively young. I mean, I could get a master's degree at UM. Maybe I could do something. And she said, did you ever think that the best thing that you could do is be yourself and put him in the hands, you know, get him the therapy that he needs, get him to the help that he did? And so when I went through that process, which was very grueling, without a lot of support because from I'm a Latina woman and in the Latina family it was just unthought of that I wasn't going to stop working. I mean we had the financial resources so it really wasn't a money decision as to what, the fact that I needed to stay working. And I decided that day when I finally said I was going to continue working that every day that I worked it was going to be to make a difference. And so if I couldn't teach him the things that I needed to teach him I would make sure that I would have all the resources available for him to do that. I would make sure that I would help other women and other families who didn't have the access to the information that I had and I would work on not only fundraising, which we did a lot of for autism and um, you know, in the middle of all the things I did, run walkathons and things like that, but primarily focusing not only on money but also on getting information and on helping families. And I said, you know what, there's another way to this. It's not just that I have to stop doing what I'm doing, but that when, now that what I do has a lot more meaning than it did before. And every hour that I'm not home, every day that you know, I'm on the road in Sao Paulo sleeping somewhere, it has to be relevant. It has to be to make a difference. You know? And I think that was very helpful to me in making that choice and staying on it. You, you have a husband who also built a school now for them. Yes, we built the very first um, 
charter school for autism um, in South Florida. Um, we, you know, I started, you know, I don't know, 10, 11 years ago, I, we, I joined this organization called NAR that's now Autism Speaks, and I was on the board of it, and we did a walkathon. And I remember at the time, I really didn't have a lot of time to put this walkathon together. So I thought, we need to do it a little bit different. And so, and it was very, you know, very based, you know, very focused on um, the typical demographics of South Florida, but it wasn't, it was missing a voice from the Latino community because all the information that was available was in English, not in Spanish. So I ended up calling the TV stations, putting these things together, and today, you know, that walkathon is a complete reflection of the demographics of South Florida. It is Latino, it is American, it is Haitian. And actually, the president who's up here in New York comes down every year because he says that our walkathon is the only one that starts with a Zumba class, <laughs> the only one that has information as to all the support services in multiple languages, and a true, you know, acceptance of that. And, you know, I think my role has been better doing that and, and getting him the medical treatment and, and fight in doing that than it would have been if I would have stayed home and ultimately been somewhat frustrated because I just didn't have the tools that I needed to, to deal with that. Carolina, do you have a comment? Um, <laughs> yes, no, I think this is one of those issues that all women face we did, and I think young women now also, because it's so challenging out there. And uh, when I talk with young women, I sort of think, you know, you need to reflect on this. You need to see how you want to deal with it, because we're each different, but it's worthwhile to try and see what that balance is. When I went off to college, uh, I came up to the United States, and I was the first one in my father. <laughs> who was an engineer and had graduated very early in his 18th. He heard about this institute in Massachusetts. And he went and took an exam with a dictionary, because he didn't know any English at MIT. And because it was math, he passed. And he got his BA there and then went back and got a PhD. And he felt that the education he received here changed his life and opened his view onto the world, et cetera. So much so that when he was president, one of the last things he did was give the commencement at MIT. And I must say that must, was one of his happiest days because he was talking to this young generation about how important it was and all the things they could do with their education. And he was talking at the end of his presidency, which had been very hard. It reminds me a lot of what President Calderon has done. My father was the one who faced up to narco trafficking at the time of Pablo Escobar. And it was very, very, very hard. And he was questioned just as President Calderon has been questioned, but they never doubted that this is what they had to do. And um, so I came up to the States and I studied. So then I had it very clear that at the beginning when I got married, I was going to work. But I was also going to have a family. So I worked because I felt I needed to establish my credentials for myself. I think it's more a thing of... And then I had my children, and there were moments, I never stopped working, but I worked from home, and there were jobs that I didn't take, which were government jobs, just because they were sort of next to the president, 24-hour kind of jobs, and I didn't want to do that. But I never stopped. And even when I became foreign minister, it was interesting because I still had my youngest daughter at home, and I wanted to be there for her. And so I felt a little bit guilty about accepting a job that I felt meant that I had to be out every single night in some kind of event. So I talked to some of my, the, my predecessors, but especially I was the third foreign minister. And I talked to some of the foreign ministers that I met. And we all agreed that what we needed to do as foreign ministers was to be available to the ambassadors from the other countries, but it didn't have to be at night. We could be there from 7 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night, then we could go home. And you established a rule. I would go to a dinner party only if a president or a foreign minister was there, but not to all the other events. And if you apply a rule which is the same for everybody, nobody gets hurt, and they understand that you are also there with your family. And I had no problem with that. What was very interesting was in my first UN session, Madeleine Albright had set up a group and it was for women foreign ministers to talk, but not about our foreign policies. It was about the challenges of being a foreign minister. 
and it was talking about these kind of issues. How do you deal with your son? Some of the foreign ministers had brought their sons to the UN. Others had dealt with it, and it was just setting this kind of network so that you could talk about issues that were very much related to being a woman, to dealing with both roles, enjoying both roles, but the, you know, the challenges it has, and I think that what we heard today from President Bachelet and the First Lady uh, Margarita Zavala, I think means that we need to work on policies, we need to work at home, etc. But also, we can also learn and try and establish rules a little bit different that take into account the way that we want to deal and manage this balance, which is a balance. I think you've, many of you have probably read Anne-Marie Slaughter's article in the Atlantic, and it, she, play, she puts it on the table, and it is a challenge, and we'll need to continue thinking about it and seeing how we can deal with it best. Carolina. Picasso personal, la verdad que nunca me planteé no trabajar. Eh, o sea, era obvio que venía al colegio o la universidad a trabajar y, y mi generación en general eh, ya tiene esa línea y, y de ahí a la gente joven realmente eh, es un dato el, el tema. O sea, todas van a trabajar hoy día, eh, estaba la, la expresidenta de Chile acá, pero hoy día uno le pregunta, nosotros vamos mucho donde, donde gente joven a los colegios, a dar charlas, a las universidades, y llama la atención eh, en los colegios, en cursos chiquititos de niñas de 11 años, 12 años, le preguntan qué quiere ser cuando grande, y hoy día dicen presidente de Chile. Es una respuesta. Entonces, la verdad que, que uno ve, una, eh, es que es increíble, y, y en realidad uno ve que ahora no hay límites, la gente joven está eh, con el chip que el tema de trabajar eh, tiene obviamente ventajas para uno y sobre todo una ventaja para el país, yo estoy una convencida y eso un poco lo han demostrado las cifras en Chile, el hecho de que la mujer participe cada día más en, en, en el trabajo, sin duda ha influido en la economía del país. Nosotros la experiencia que tuvimos hace poco, hace un mes, eh, nos llamó, no sé si ustedes conocen Codelco, lo que es en Chile, Chile es uno de los países eh, principales productores de cobre del mundo, Codelco es la, eh, una empresa estatal que obviamente eh, una, eh, que tiene un rol relevante y nos dice, las necesito contratar, nosotros así como... Esto hace 10 años no era pasado, porque necesito subir la participación femenina, que hoy día tiene un 7%, a un 20% el año 2015. Entonces, eh, es un desafío, un desafío para el país, un desafío por nosotros. Y la verdad que, bueno, yo además en el caso particular eh, tengo la suerte de tener un marido que, que me ha ayudado montones, ha sido eh, un apoyo fundamental, ha entendido muy bien lo que me gusta y creo que cuando uno está contenta se refleja y lo refleja en el resto y una familia... La verdad que tengo una suerte enorme con mis hijos, que también son los primeros hinchas de lo que yo hago. Entonces he tenido suerte también en ese sentido y he, tenido, he sabido también manejar mis tiempos. Yo opino igual que Carolina, uno tiene eh, las cosas ordenadas con tiempo, se pueden manejar, yo tengo horario, eh, no empiezo reuniones a las 7 de la tarde bajo ninguna circunstancia y, y muchos hombres te piden reuniones a las 6, no, hasta tal hora, qué sé yo. Los bancos en Chile al menos trabajan hasta las 2 de la tarde y, y nadie se ha muerto, entonces... Bueno, si eso funciona, esto también. Gracias. Um, vamos a tomar um, dos o tres preguntas juntos. Let's take three questions together and then we can ask. We have one here, Diana. Um, one there and, okay, so let's start. Where did, who did I just say first? Uh, Beatrice, you can't raise your hand. Beatrice came from Argentina with a broken arm. In español o inglés, como tú quieras. Como tú quieras. Open spaces for, for, for less discrimination for others. So 
practices at your work uh, in order to promote uh, women's inclusion in leadership roles? Thank you. Let's take a couple of questions together. Uh, Diana? Rainey. Diana Negroponte, the Brookings Institution a think tank in Washington. Ladies, you are very fortunate. You made a choice. But most women have no choice. They have to work to feed their children. Nor do they have care at home to look after those children. Those, those children are brought up by the television or by the gangs in the area they live. What are your public policy proposals to address these very serious questions which most women are forced to encounter? Thank you. And let's, right here, in the perp, right here, I think. Thank you. And one there, and then we'll let Gracias. you answer the four together. Gracias. Eh, buenos días, yo soy Paula Villaseñor, soy de México, soy consultora en temas de reforma educativa, trabajo para el Instituto de Innovación Educativa en México y me especializo en el área de América Latina. Eh, bueno, las quiero felicitar por ser eh, un ejemplo, tanto a nivel profesional como personal, de lo que pueden lograr las mujeres. Y considerando este éxito que tienen, quisiera preguntarles justamente qué ventaja comparativa creen que tienen o han eh, detectado a lo largo de su carrera profesional con respecto a los hombres que las ha llevado a, a tener este éxito. Se los pregunto porque uno de los temas en los que estoy trabajando actualmente es el de habilidades, el de competencias, cómo lograr que los sistemas educativos cambien las habilidades de las personas. Y me interesa mucho este tema en específico en, en las mujeres. ¿Qué ventaja comparativa creen ustedes tener que les ha permitido eh, alcanzar este éxito? Gracias. Eh, eh, la última pregunta aquí y después lo puedo responder a las cuatro preguntas. Okay, my, my name is Vandes Cartesini. I'm from Brazil. I have my chance to talk. So, it's uh, just to link the first question to the other, uh, that where she said, it's uh, maybe um, we need to focus a little bit about uh, Latin cultural at home and American and, you know, Anglo-Saxon cultural at home. And this makes a lot of difference because uh, most of us, I have two children too, two men, but uh, um, we have mostly some kind of help at home. And this make a lot of change when we face and challenge that force you to make a decision. You can count on family, mostly very close, and they open for help. And uh, you have mates. You have capacity to pay for mates. So maybe cultural behave just help us as a Latin women and do not do the same for Anglo-Saxon ones. Thank you. Thank you. Carolina, do you want to start? Yes, no, I mean, what Diana says is so absolutely true and that was why at the beginning I always felt very privileged. I was privileged because of the education, I was privileged because this was a choice and I think I, a lot of us, that's what drives us. We want to make a difference. And in Colombia, more and more we're starting to realize that education needs to start when children are born, that we need to reach out to them. These are the formative years, and more and more we're trying to reach down, and that's a big effort that's being made. Before we thought we, uh, there have been programs to take care of children, but now we realize that we really need to make sure that they get the appropriate uh, nutrition and education, and so we're working more and more on that, but it's something that is, we're all now conscious of it, and we just need to make it happen. About, um, and so we're right. We do, we're very privileged also because we've had help and support, et cetera, and that makes it so much easier. I admire American women very much. It's so much harder. Um, I think that in your culture, for, I hope the men are helping more. That's where, as Margarita says, we need to train, our, <laughs> help our men understand the role that they need to play. And a lot of it comes from the mothers that continue to treat their sons differently from their daughters. They expect different things. So as mothers, we have to expect the same things from as daughters and sons and changing our habits and changing our culture and all that. 
So um, in that way, it, it has been so much easier in another uh, for us. And I haven't felt that kind of discrimination, probably because I'm in the public sector. And um, I was always, I, I was either in the, somehow, I was working along with men and I have not felt that kind of discrimination. But I have been very much aware of having women work with me. And I work very well with women and I love working with young women. So when I was for, named foreign minister, two of the women I asked to work with me were just starting their pregnancy and they said, I'm in my first month or I'm in my third month. Will you still take me? I said, of course. And we're going to show the, at the foreign ministry that that doesn't matter. You will come in. You'll work with me for six months. You have your child. You'll take your leave and you'll come back. And that's natural and normal. And this is the kind of attitude that I've tried to show that we need to respect the life cycle the, of women and men and to, to make a difference. So... Uh, I just feel that I've been very, very privileged, and I just hope and I have tried to keep very, very present that I can make a difference and that I need to be focusing on how to make a difference and that helping women, I totally agree with Margarita, a happy woman is a happy family, is a happy society, and it's very hard for so many women, and we really do have uh, to make that investment and, and make that difference. Thank you. Patty? I have faced a lot of discrimination. I still face discrimination. When I first started in my career, because I was so young, most people thought, not that I was the lawyer, but that I was the secretary when I walked into a meeting. <laughs> then when it got older and, you know, they just, I said I grew up in a very male-dominated profession. You know, they were afraid to say, is she fat, is she pregnant? Like, it was, you know, they, they really tried, but it was very uncomfortable because they just weren't used to having the um, the women issues and I think you know I found I think part of it is education and educating your peers I think it is harder for women because even if you work in an organization where you educate people and you sensitize them to the implicit biases to the to the discrimination that they don't understand they, they, what they really need to focus on is the value that you bring into the organization and I think it's hard for women that are facing discrimination to stay focused on the fact that what you need to explain to people is the value that you bring and, and focus more on having the people recognize your value because I think sometimes the women that are working and that are you know, doing this just like, well, you know, I did this and you just assume everybody saw the value that you did, but you find that most women you know, have low egos, are very comfortable sharing credit, are very comfortable, they create work environments if they're successful that, um, you know, are men and women and, and tend to give away a lot more credit, you know, which I think is a wonderful thing about that. But in doing so, it's just because you're building a team and you're building bridges within an organization and you're working hard and you're putting the minds together and, th and that you want to do that, it shouldn't be that the, that the recognition is lost, that somehow the value that you brought to the table is somehow diversified. I, I you know, I'm a big believer of giving credit to the team and, and there's no way that I could think of any particular um, thing that I have done that was done by myself. It has always been with a tremendous amount of support. My family, my friends, my coworkers, my competitors, I mean, you know, it has been that team building thing that has allowed me to continue practicing in my practice and raise my children, and it just would not be possible from, from that. And so I, I think that in organizations that are focused on eliminating discrimination, which I think most are, and, not, and, and, and it's interesting because many of them are focused on eliminating discrimination because you know, it sounds like it's a bad thing to be discrimination, but the real reason I think that the people are very focused on it on the organization side is it's good business. It makes, it, it, they have finally realized, I mean, we have lots of diversity programs and, in, in, you know, we're the fifth largest law firm in the United States. We have 1,800 lawyers. We have so many different programs. Um, and, and we do a lot of charitable things. And so what I think has been different about this diversity issue to at least large organizations is that it's no longer a good thing to do. It's actually good business. And, and I think you find that organizations are more and more trying to figure out how they could be more effective in this area, 
maybe, I mean, the fact that they believe in it now is great, and that's always a plus. And if they don't believe in it, it doesn't really matter because they know that it's good business and that they know that it goes to the economic development of, of their consumers and that it goes to the economic development of a country. And so I think that's one thing that in the women's, you know, I've been practicing for almost 25 years. That's one development that I have seen. Women's issues have been always very important to me. But I think we have finally changed the argument from there. It's almost like we tried to say it was a good thing. We tried to say a happy woman is a happy home, a happy work environment. And people just maybe just, and I think the, the organization has somehow shifted it to, you know what, it's actually good business. We're 50% of the workforce. We're the persons that go out and buy the consumer goods. So maybe if you didn't believe on the equality because the glass ceiling kind of was still kind of fuzzy for you, at least today know that from an economic and business perspective and from a country perspective, it makes good sense. You know, the, it, when now during the recession, when you look at the statistics, it's the first time, there were certain moments in time that it was the first time in the United States there were more women working than men. For not necessarily good reasons, for, for reasons that, you know, during the reorganizations of companies, men made more money than women. So it was, you know, if you could let go of one or two men in an organization and, you know, do your, your downturn analysis, you could find a woman to do the job for a lot less. Whatever reason that that, and many other reasons, but whatever reason it is, it is interesting to see that it is 50% of the workforce. And that in and of itself comes something. So Beatriz, I think it's a challenge. I think. It's an educational thing, and I think it's finding the right argument. If it's going to be based on economic principles, if it's going to be based on the security of the country, because you know, happy women focus on on can balance both and make sure that their children don't go into gangs that are more involved. Whatever it is, it's certainly something that's relevant that that needs to to be done. Um, and the one thing I wanted to say to you, Diana, is I, I completely agree with you on the choice issue. And I think in these women's, I think in these women's initiatives that I work on, the key is to give them a choice, is to find ways that we can create women, all women should have a choice. All, I, I don't think all women need to work and I don't think all women need to stay home. I think all women need to have, be able to make that choice. And, and that's a personal choice and I think anything that we can do to facilitate that. I think both roles are equally respected. And, you know, I always say I don't do either one very well. You know, if I did one or I did the other, I would do it better. But, but having that choice, I think, is a fundamental um, right that we need to work towards. Thank you. Carolina. Yeah. Um, la, la discriminación en sí eh, es una cosa que me tocó, como les, como les decía recién, sentirla solamente cuando traté de obtener mi primer trabajo como agrónoma en el campo, pero después de eso la verdad que, que han sido eh, al revés, yo diría que, que la, el, en el mundo en que, en que yo me desenvuelvo hoy día es el mundo de los negocios en Chile, y la verdad que me parece a mí que a pesar de ser un país machista, como comentábamos, en ese orden de cosas creo que se ha entendido el, cada vez más las capacidades de la mujer, es súper común hoy día que uno escuche decir a todos los hombres que las mujeres trabajan súper bien, son súper comprometidas, eh, se quedan más tiempo porque tratan de negociar en la media jornada, tres cuartos jornada, al final es una cosa, un híbrido, pero finalmente eh, lo que se logra es que, es que están contentos, ¿eh? los hombres hoy día están contentos con contratar mujeres, eh, lo que necesitamos es que estén en cargos más importantes. Eh, nosotros, bueno, nos dedicamos a eso, somos una organización que, que se podría decir que, que es peleadora en ese sentido y, y la acogida que hemos tenido siempre ha sido eh, excelente. Eh, nos han pasado cosas divertidas, que realmente nosotros nos llamamos mujeres empresarias, entonces eh, un, un caballero, que, eh, un, ejecutivo, un alto ejecutivo nos dice, sí, ah, ustedes son las mujeres empeñosas. Ah, no sé cómo es la traducción exacta, pero es que entre empeñosa y empresaria hay una gran diferencia. Entonces nos da un poco risa, pero la, la verdad que y nos decían nada ah, estas chiquillas que vienen para acá, qué sé yo, pero la verdad finalmente uno trata de, de, tiene que sacar lo positivo de esto y es que estamos haciendo una labor, yo creo, importante en demostrar, y eso es relevante como lo que se ha dicho acá, en datos, y eso es lo que le importa finalmente, estamos, cuando estamos hablando de negocio, en datos que conviene contratar mujeres. Y es así, está demostrado por todos los estudios que ustedes vieron, y, y, y bueno, la verdad que yo creo que hay un típico ejemplo que se dice que, que si Lehman Brothers hubiera sido Lehman Sisters, no hubiera pasado, porque las mujeres tenemos otra manera de ver las cosas, y es así, y yo creo que hoy día 
las cosas están cambiando. Eh, eh, es imposible, ¿cierto?, que en directorios de empresas de retail, que, en que el 80% de las decisiones la toma la mujer, no haya ninguna directora mujer. Eso antes pasaba, hoy día ya no pasa. Y hay, hay por lo tanto, ciertos signos que nosotros vemos que las cosas están cambiando y que, sinceramente, el tema eh, está mejorando. Yo creo que la discriminación sí se ve, de repente, en ciertos niveles, eh, tal vez más bajo de, de, de trabajo, y eso, sin duda, es un tema que, que hay leyes, incluso en, en Chile, que se han hecho al respecto y yo creo que ha ido eh, mejorando sustancialmente. Con respecto a, a, a la ayuda doméstica, un poco lo que, el tema que hablaba, yo creo que es verdad que la cultura latinoamericana en ese sentido se desfavorecía por el tema de tener una ayuda en la casa, en mi país al menos casi, casi todas tenemos la oportunidad de tenerlo. En Argentina creo que no es así, si no me equivoco, es una excepción, ¿ah? pero, pero en general es una ayuda tremenda y, y ayuda mucho. Ahora, es una, un, también es un, un contrasentido porque a la larga esta, estas mujeres que nos ayudan a nosotros igual tienen obviamente esta carga de llegar a su casa a, a trabajar, pero también es una oportunidad para ellas de, de trabajo muchas veces, hoy día ya tienen remuneraciones bastante buena, no es, una, no, no es un trabajo que eh, hay muchas leyes que las protegen, etcétera, por lo tanto me parece que, que es una ayuda necesaria y que si la tenemos eh, obviamente es bienvenida. Eh, y con respecto a la, a la, al tema muy importante de, de, las, de aquellas mujeres que no tienen opción de trabajar y que sí deben hacerlo, creo que está en nosotras, ah, y eso es súper relevante, eh, apoyar ese tipo de, de iniciativa. Las mujeres tienden a contratar mujeres y eso es un, como un círculo virtuoso que nosotros tenemos que, que ojalá incentivarlo más y, y de esa manera eh, ir un poco eh, en la pirámide favoreciendo a todas aquellas mujeres que efectivamente no tienen otra opción de hacerlo. En el caso de Chile, en el último censo que salió recién hace unos meses, eh, el 50%, el 49, algo por ciento de los hogares en Chile son manejados por una mujer. Y eso es bastante increíble porque en el, último, en el censo anterior era el 33% y hoy día ya está cerca del 50%, por lo tanto vemos ahí que obviamente viendo todo el estrato social una gran parte de, proviene sin duda de los hogares en que la mujer no tiene opción y ahí está en nuestra labor diaria eh, apoyarla y, y obviamente en la práctica con los negocios. With that, I sadly I know there are a lot more questions and um, there are several more panels, so I think and lots of and a coffee break coming up, so you can ask more questions. Um, but I want to thank Um, our three panelists, Carolina, Carolina, and Patty, um, because they shared very special personal stories. And that's what role models and ultimately mentors are all about, when you can listen to someone, identify with them, and think about what that means to you. So I want to thank them for their outstanding presentation. <laughs>